This is episode 19 with Jacob Morgan and Matt Abrahams. Welcome to the Futures Intelligent Leadership Flowcast. This is your host, Tyler Mongan. I am the president of Haku Global. This is a space for globally minded experts to dialogue about the future of leadership with a focus on the key question, how can leadership be more intelligent about futures? From this conversation, innovative wisdom, practical tools, and actionable insights emerge to help future-ready leaders thrive in an uncertain, complex, and exponentially changing world. Let's jump in to the dialogue. Aloha, and welcome to this episode of the Futures Intelligent Leadership Flowcast. This is your host, Tyler Mongan, and today my co-hosts are Jacob Morgan and Matt Abrahams. Jacob is a keynote and TED speaker and four-time best-selling author. He is the founder of futureofworkuniversity.com. He is also the host of the Future of Work podcast and co-host of the Be Your Own Boss podcast. Jacob's most recent book is titled The Future Leader. It was released in 2020, and he interviewed 140 CEOs from around the world to discover insights on what it takes to be a leader in the future. You can find out more about Jacob and his work at thefutureorganization.com. Matt is principal and co-founder of Bold Echo Communication Solutions. He coaches Silicon Valley executives and business professionals on communication and presentation skills. He is also a lecturer at Stanford University, teaching strategic communication courses and workshops at the Graduate School of Business. He helps future business leaders to be more authentic, confident, and compelling communicators. You can find out more about Matt's work at boldecho.com. As Jacob mentions in this episode, he interviewed 140 CEOs from around the world for his new book, and he asked them what they thought are the core skills of a future leader, and the top skill that current leaders think future leaders need to be successful is a capability and capacity to be a futurist. This is interesting to me because it's relevant to this podcast and also relevant to the mission of our company, Haku Global, to develop more future intelligent leadership. I've been working in the futures innovation and strategic foresight space for the past four years, and I know there is still a lot of work that needs to be done to upskill leadership and organizations to be more prepared for the future. We are all naturally futurists. It is one of the superpowers of the human brain to be able to consciously think about plans and scenarios far into the future. We utilize this skill all the time when we think about our personal life, career, health, and purpose. But for some reason, when we enter the business space, we tend to put our head down and work. We fall prey to quarterly goals and short-termism. Even at the leadership level, we see this happening. At the same time, studies show that future-focused or future-fit organizations have higher profitability, more growth, and more employee engagement. It begs the question, why haven't more leaders invested in scaling future intelligence across the organization? I think you will find some of the answers in this dialogue. In today's episode, we discuss how to stay relevant as a leader, how to communicate your leadership message in a rapid, changing business landscape, the difference between amateur and pro-futurists, how storytelling can make others a part of your future vision, the importance of being transparent with your values, and why leadership should be optimistic about the future. Let's listen. Aloha, Matt and Jacob. Thank you both for being here on this podcast today. And as always, I want to start with this key question of how can leadership be more intelligent about futures or the future, given this climate of uncertainty, complexity, and exponential change in the world? And I'd like to start with Jacob, if you could answer this from your perspective or from your work. Sure. Well, first, this isn't new. Uh, you know, throughout history, nobody ever knew what the future was going to bring. Things have always changed. Things have always been turbulent and tough and, and uneasy. So it's not as if um, this question is just something that's relevant for today. This is something that's always been relevant, right? It's how do you, how do you keep up? How do you stay relevant? How do you thrive in uh, whatever change happens? 
And it's interesting because this is what my new book was all about. And I wrote a book called The Future Leader, which specifically looked at this very question. And I interviewed 140 CEOs around the world at uh, big companies like Audi and Verizon, Best Buy, MasterCard, et cetera. And I asked them, what are some of the biggest trends that are going to be shaping the way that we lead our organizations? Hmm. And pace of change was one of the biggest trends that they identified, as was the changes in technology and automation. And interestingly enough, the top skill that they identified as being most relevant for current and future leaders was the skill of the futurist, mm. which I know you're involved with a lot of, uh, you know, the different futurist societies that are out there. So I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear this. <laughs> so it's the number one skill that leaders believe other leaders need to have is how do you think in terms of different scenarios and possibilities and, um, you know, not just looking at one path, but how do you simultaneously start to think of different paths at the same time? So when I think of this question, there were a series of several skills and mindsets that these CEOs identified as being most crucial. There was nine of them. I won't go, won't go through all nine of them. But I think in this kind of a world, it's very important to have curiosity, to have a growth mindset to surround yourself with people who are not like you, who don't think like you, who don't believe in the same things that you believe. I think it's important to embrace diversity, to think big picture and have a global mindset. And perhaps most importantly is to be a perpetual learner, to be a lifelong learner. I think that's probably the, the best thing that any individual can do hmm to make sure that they stay relevant because change is the only constant. And so how do you adapt in the changing world? Well, you need to, as Bruce Lee said, you have to be like water. And I think uh, that curiosity and perpetual learning is a great place to start. Thanks, Jacob. And Matt, how do you answer it from your perspective? Well, first, uh, thanks for having me on. And Jacob, mm -hmm. I love that you ended by quoting Bruce Lee as a, as a lifelong martial artist and somebody who, who really likes the philosophy underlying the martial arts. Uh, to, to hear a Bruce Lee quote makes me very happy. Uh, and, and really what, what the, the quote is about is it's about being adaptable and being able to adjust and adapt. And from my perspective, where I, I see communication as, a, as an absolutely critical component for all interaction, but especially in an ever-changing world, to me, it's all about making sure that you understand not only what's happening, but how you communicate, frame, and then present that information to others. So mm. adaptability is for sure the, the key skill in communication that many people don't focus on is listening. And listening requires silence, reflection, thinking. And to me, one of the biggest things that leaders can do is to pause and as Jacob alluded to, uh, reflect on what might be leading to this from different perspectives. I think surrounding yourselves with others who have different viewpoints, diverse insights and experiences can be helpful. But it's really about the reflection, it's then adapting that and then figuring out how to message it in a way that is respectful of and targeted to the different audiences that you communicate. So for me, uh, much like Jacob said, it's about adapting, it's about reflecting, and then it's about acting on that and being inclusive in the way you think about it, but also communicate it. Great, thanks, Matt. And um, I'd like to kind of follow up with uh, Jacob real quick on your point. You know, one of the things I see in a lot of organizations is that it's hard for them to understand sometimes how, um, you know, how foresight uh, scenarios and understanding the future you know, lines up in the value chain um, and where they can really integrate that into like strategy or uh, into decision making. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because we do a pretty good job of, I think, in our personal lives, thinking in terms of, uh, quote unquote, the, the futurist, where whenever we move to a new location, for example, we think about, you know, what's going to happen to the property value. Uh, are the schools good? What's going to happen if we move? When you go on a first date with somebody, you think, is this somebody I can spend the rest of my life with? How would they handle a time of crisis? Uh, what are my parents going to think? Like you think about all these different scenarios and possibilities in your head, in your personal mm -hmm. life. But then for some reason, when you show up to work, it's just what task do I need to do? What's right in front of me? Uh, you know, what do I got to get? The, you're like, you're 
Mm. You're just not in that mindset of thinking big picture and thinking of different scenarios and possibilities. Mm. And as I mentioned, from the 140 CEOs I interviewed, they identify that this is one of the most crucial skills for current and future leaders to have. And so I think it just starts with asking a series of, of questions around what do you want the future to look like? Why might something happen? Why, you know, what else might happen? Mm. And what might cause something to happen or not happen? And when you start to just think in terms of those basic four questions, uh, you will inherently start to embrace this skill of the futurist. And it's essential in a rapidly changing world because you don't know what the future is going to bring. How can you possibly pick one path and go down it? And I play a lot of chess, and the, the analogy that I always like to use is what separates a great chess player from an amateur chess player is that chess players who are not that good tend to think in terms of moves. Like, I'm going to make this move, my opponent's mm. going to make that move. And you think in just, you know, single, single terms. But grandmasters and top chess players, they think in terms of, well, my opponent might play this, and if he plays one of these things, then I might respond to one of these things. Like you have different ideas and scenarios in your head. Mm. And ultimately, the whole point of this is not to predict the future, but it's to help make sure that you're not surprised by what the future might bring. And I think there's a big difference. So don't try to see around a corner. You try to kind of peek around several corners to see which path you want to go down. Mm. And I, I think by asking these questions, um, people will really start to be able to embrace that kind of a skill. No, it's really great perspective. And I'm curious then, Matt, from your perspective, is when we do have a, like a lot of alternative futures uh, or a lot of corners to look and peek around, how does a leader or how can a leader communicate the, the future to uh, their followers? One of the key skills uh, I think a leader needs to develop in terms of their communication in general is how to tell stories effectively and that engage and involve uh, lots of different divergent and, and inclusive opinions. So creating scenarios and stories that reflect possible futures and being able to articulate those clearly are definitely something leaders need to work on. And at, and at the business school at Stanford, we have lots of courses where we teach students the way to effectively tell stories, structure stories, et cetera. So I think storytelling is part of that, painting the, the, the vision of what the future could be, and then finding themes that are consistent across the different visions of the future and helping people understand the importance of those themes and what they can do to be part of or help enact certain versions of the future. So to me, it's being able to understand the landscape and then translate it into stories that resonate with people. That's interesting. So the basic idea you're saying is even if there are multiple alternative futures, uh, there could be a common theme between all of them. And if the leader can tap into that and also help people understand how they fit into that theme, they're going to, they're going to kind of hit the, the wide landscape in front of them. Is that exactly. And, and it's a way of getting alignment. It's a way mm -hmm. of helping people be motivated towards, or, or perhaps to begin to build, to fortify against something that might be potentially negative in the future. Mm -hmm. So being able to, to look at the possible futures, articulate them, and then look for themes across them, I think is critical. Mm -hmm. and, and Jacob, back to one of the things you said earlier too, was this idea of the speed of disruption or yeah, the speed of change, sorry, and how that is a big disruption in the marketplace. And, you know, what can leaders do about this, <laughs> this rapid speed of change that we, we kind of feel, or at least experience? To embrace that this is the new normal. <laughs> uh, you know, this is the new way of working. And I asked this very same question to the CEOs I interviewed. I said, how do you keep up? Mm. And uh, they all collectively said, well, most of them said that you embrace that this is the new normal. You don't try to fight it or push against it. You mm. embrace that this is the world that we live in, that things change quickly, which means that you need to test and experiment and use data and surround yourself with people who can do things that you can't do and give them autonomy and freedom. Uh, and basically, you need to challenge a lot of the conventional ideas that we have around work. And we've been seeing that, especially now more than ever before with what's happening with COVID. How many organizations out there are now being forced to implement programs that for decades we've been talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. flexible work initiatives, uh, leading remote teams, changing the way that we think about performance management. These are not new concepts. These We've been talking about this stuff for probably even before I was born. Mm. And here comes a virus. And now all of a sudden, what people have been trying to do in uh, you know, 40, 50 years, we're doing in four or five months. Mm. Uh, so you need to have that, um, that mindset, that skill of just test, experiment, iterate, embrace that this is the new normal. Uh, and I think as a leader, probably the best thing that you can do is don't try to put out fires. You start, uh, you try to start the fires, not mm. put them out, right? I mean, um, people will emulate the behaviors that you as a leader exhibit. And if you encourage others to challenge convention, come up with ideas, give them autonomy, um, then that is the kind of workforce that you will create. And I think that's the kind of workforce that we need in a rapidly changing world. Matt, your thoughts on that? So I absolutely agree with this notion of rapid prototyping, testing things out, uh, challenging in a creative way. Uh, you know, at the business school, we spend a lot of time talking about this uh, process for creating products and ideas, this idea of minimally viable product design. And those principles apply to leadership in general. It's not just how you get ideas out the door, it's, it's how you lead. So it's rapid prototyping, A-B testing, being flexible, making sure you understand the audience that you're communicating to or leading. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely agree that that flexibility and having that mindset that's open can be incredibly helpful. The leaders that I've worked with, the leaders that I've worked for, who challenge people, reward not just success, but also failure, are the ones that, that really get their constituents to admire them and can help grow a company much more quickly than individuals who are just about trying to manage the status quo and, and, and be very cautious as they go about their business. Mm. I'd love to follow up to Matt on this idea of, you know, with in this environment of, you know, rapid, rapid change, how can leadership communicate the right, the right story, the right message? Um, you know, it seems like, especially in this situation with COVID that a lot of leaders are having a hard time, you know, staying up with all the change and having the story, you know, be the right story. And then all of a sudden it changes and then you start to lose people, right? Because they get a little confused about what's the story now. Um, so what can leadership do? So a couple things that come to mind. First, the, the striving for right, I think, gets people into trouble. There is no mm -hmm. right message. There are better and there are worse messages. So putting the pressure to do it right, I think, uh, it sets people up for, for stress and, and perhaps mm -hmm. failure. But really understanding the core values that you as a person have and the core values that your team and organization and business have can really help. And you, you hang your hat on the core principles and themes and then adjust and adapt them as the environment changes. So if, for example, transparency is a value that you hold true, then transparency needs to be part of your messaging, the way you message and the way you encourage others to message. So when things are chaotic, when things are ever changing, you need to have some core guiding principles that you can flex, rely on, and, ex and adjust and adapt to help you tell that story right. And, mm -hmm. and rather than trying to take every input, every detail, and, and refashion your message to it, uh, stick with the general principles, the guidelines, and that's what helps with leadership, and that's what helps with good communication. Any uh, follow-up thoughts on that, Jacob? No, I mean, I com completely agree. And I think a lot of leaders need to embrace that uh, mistakes and failure will happen, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, it's, it's how you learn, it's how you grow, and how you develop. And I think that instead of punishing any kind of failure, we need to look at all those things as, as learning and teaching moments. And one of the other things that, that Matt said around these um, these principles and these values that you have. This is also one of the things that a lot of these CEOs I interviewed identified as being most crucial for future leaders is being mm -hmm. able to communicate what your, uh, what your morals are um, mm -hmm. that you, and what you being transparent. And for many, many decades, leaders have gotten away with sort of playing in the gray area. You know, they wouldn't really take a stance on something. They, you know, they don't want to upset anybody. They want to play in the neutral zone. Mm -hmm. And more and more, what we're starting to see from employees is 
they don't want leaders who are in the neutral zone. They want leaders who are going to take a stance for something. They want to know that their leaders are fighting for something, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a social cause or an injustice. I mean, anything the employees want to know, and this goes back to purpose and meaning that we're all craving for. They want to know that they're part of an organization that's going to take a stance. And mm -hmm. leaders, I think, have for a long time, whether you're a mid-level leader or a senior level leader, and even just as an individual, we're always scared to have people disagree with what we stand for. Mm -hmm. But I think the far bigger fear isn't that other people are going to disagree with us. It's that they don't know what we stand for to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think leaders need to embrace. It's okay if people disagree with something that you believe in. We're not all going to agree on the same things. That's just part of being human. But the important thing is that people know what you stand for, especially as a leader, because this is where the purpose and the meaning and impact comes from. So um, I, I think that that's very, very important for, for all of us to do. Well, very interesting. How, Matt, how do you think leaders can communicate uh, what they stand for um, and not, not lose everybody, <laughs> you know, at least keep some followers? Right. So a lot of people, when they, they look to, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk, mm. don't necessarily think about what they communicate through the environment they create, mm. through the spaces of collaboration and tools they provide people with. So the only thing I would add to that is you communicate much as much, if not more, not just through the words you say, but the way you say it, the environment you create, the interactions that you allow for, the interactions you don't allow for. So leaders need to think about the way in which they represent their belief system in a much broader way than just the words that they use. So uh, I often work with the students I work with, the people I coach, to think about your values, understand them, stockpile examples and stories that are relevant to them so you can deploy them quickly. And then most mm -hmm. importantly, think about how you exist in live your life and body your leadership and your values so that people see that you are truly consistent. Mm -hmm. So it's a much bigger canvas that we have to paint our values on than just the words that we speak. Mm, very good point. Um, I want to shift a little bit and ask Jacob to start on this idea of what, you know, what do, what do leaders feel about the future? What's kind of their sense? I know a lot of people have a lot of maybe anxiety or uncertainty uh, about the future and uh, I guess even the ethics of the direction it's going. And I'm curious what you learned from the people you interviewed. In general, I would say there's a sense of optimism um, mm. looking at the long run. Of course, short term, there are all sorts of disruptions and changes and, and tough times that organizations are trying to get through. But I think most of the leaders are very optimistic and positive about the, the long-term future of their businesses, of, uh, of where we're going to end up. But again, with any challenge, with any difficult time, you have to get through that difficult time first. So mm -hmm. short term will be, of course, challenging for many people. Look, I mean, as a speaker, uh, as somebody who, who writes books and, and makes a living traveling and presenting and sharing ideas, it's been extremely tough for me and for my wife as well, because it's what we both do. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you kind of have to be optimistic because mm -hmm. walking around saying, oh God, you know, the world's going to end, nothing great's going to happen. That doesn't help anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think how you can respond is, is a choice. And, you know, Blake and myself and a lot of the leaders that I've talked to, uh, I think they choose to be optimistic. They choose to be positive. They choose to believe that, when we get through this, uh, that we will be able to create a, uh, you know, a, a better world. And that's what I choose to believe as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't mean that everybody believes this. I've certainly talked to some leaders who are, um, what's the polite way of saying this, are a little bit more on the fear side of things. Mm -hmm. But I would say those people are more in the minority and the optimism and the positivity is more of the majority. Hmm. Or they could all be lying to me. <laughs> or lying to themselves, right? A little bit. Yeah, it's certainly possible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's healthy. I think it's a, that even that pragmatic optimism, like it's not going to be easy, 
now, but we're going to get through this and it's going to be good on the other end um, is really valuable, I think. Um, and Matt, from your perspective, um, what do you what do you see leadership communicate about the future? So leaders are nervous. Uh, mm -hmm. The leaders I coach, the students that I'm preparing for leadership uh, are nervous. And uh, as Jacob mentioned, uh, nervousness, it could be a call to action. Nervousness could be a call to retreat. So how you frame it and, and what it motivates you to do is a good thing. It's how you manage it. And so I think these are unsettling times and people need to think about what motivates them, why they do what they do and figure out where to find opportunities in this situation. I have been amazed at what the MBA students I teach have done in response to what's happening to their education, what's happening in their communities and in their world, how they have creatively come up with ways of serving others, ways of helping themselves and others. And that's the kind of entrepreneurial, creative spirit that's going to get us through this. But again, we have to acknowledge times are tough. Anxiety is normal. Decide to learn from it, take pause, reflect, and then figure out how you march forward. And supporting each other and helping others get through it is a critical part as well. And I've been very pleased to see that in the communities I work with. Great. And I'm curious from both of you too, what, and I'll start with Jacob, what do you think are the opportunities? What do you see as the new opportunities? Specifically for leaders or just in general? Yeah, I'd say for leaders. Probably the greatest opportunity, well, the, there are a few, but how you treat your people during times of stress, I mm. think is a tremendous opportunity. Um, are you going to be the type of leader who says, you know, who, who puts people first? and who's willing to sacrifice profits or your personal gain or any kind of financial reward? Or are you going to be the type of leader who puts the profits and the business ahead of your people? And there have been lots of stories about this. Uh, you know, here in the Bay Area, for example, we keep hearing about Uber. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there was an article that came out, I think it was a couple of days ago. And I remember reading this and apparently what happened, so Uber's going through a second round of layoffs. They're letting go another, I think, 3,000 people in addition to the two or 3,000 they already let go. Mm. And what I read is that a lot of uh, leaders, they came to the CEO and they said, look, instead of laying people off, we are willing to take a pay cut to mm. keep our jobs. Would you consider that? And the CEO gave a one-line response, which is the answer is no. Mm. And you hear stories like that, and then you hear other stories from CEOs of organizations like J.P. Morgan Chase or American Express or, uh, you know, the CEO of Marriott put out a video where you can pretty much see him crying. I mean, he's, he's uh, fighting cancer at the moment. He's, and, you know, mm. you can see that he's visibly emotionally distraught as he's delivering this address to his people. And you can see how much he cares about wanting to put his people first. And then you hear these other stories from CEOs like Uber who are basically calling him the Travis Kalanick 2.0, doesn't care about anybody, mm. uh, doesn't care about his people, trying to take money from small businesses by charging more for, um, for delivery fees for food. And it's just, it's completely, it's completely black and white. So I think during times of stress, mm. especially like now, this is a tremendous opportunity for you as a leader to show what kind of a leader you are. Mm. And are you going to be the type of person who puts your people first or are you going to be the type of leader who puts profits first mm. so there's a i think a huge opportunity there and just quick follow-up on that do you see that the leader who puts people first uh, are going to be better off in the future is that uh, a growing trend oh i think we all know the answer to that question <laughs> uh of, of course right i mean because if, if once we get through this um, this pandemic, it's going to be the leaders who put their people first, the organizations who put their people first. You're going to see that those are the ones, you know, the, the employees are going to fight for that organization. They're going to give more of themselves to that organi organization. They're going to want to be a part of that kind of an organization. Mm -hmm. Whereas the leaders who don't do that, you're basically going to have a bunch of people who are there just for a paycheck. And as soon as, soon as they mm. find something better, as soon as they get paid more, they're gonna leave. So you're gonna see a lot of um, interesting, I think, examples of, 
uh, of loyalty, of who's creating better employee experiences, of which organizations will even survive uh, because of those who are willing to put their people first. And thankfully, there have been a lot of wonderful examples and stories mm -hmm. of companies who are doing that. But then you also hear stories about what um, organizations like Uber are doing, which I think is, you know, not, not ideal. Mm. Yes, that um, I think part of the beauty of technology and communication we have in this day and age of the transparency, being able to really learn what's going on. Whereas, you know, 100 years ago, you could, a leader could get away with some things that maybe were a little more suspect and it wouldn't be as obvious. Yeah, nobody, <laughs> nobody's going to know. And today, yeah. you know, the, you're the CEO of a company, you send a memo and it's a uh, front page <laughs> on, you know, you're not going to you're not going to hide from it because yeah. you said it. And that's exactly. to me what one of the, the opportunities, Tyler, to get back to your question yeah, exactly. is that, you know, we, in terms of technology and communication, I mean, the, the ability now to flatten an organization, to centralize uh, with many different communication tools that people are now using as part of their daily interactions, now becoming part of their DNA, all of a sudden things can move more quickly. You can trace information better. I, I really think one of the opportunities out of this is more streamlined, effective communication that cuts across organizational structure, flattens how people are thinking about it. I, I really see a, a, an opportunity for organizations to align more quickly. And I think this, mm -hmm. this idea of broadening beyond the walls of an organization, I'll be very curious to see what organizations look like in terms of their physical structure within buildings, et cetera, moving forward. I, I think people have come to realize that we can get work done in a very different way mm -hmm. uh, now. And I, and I think that's exciting. And I think that's opening the door to lots more diverse opinions and diverse experiences of people who literally have been locked out of those buildings. So I, I'm excited to see how that plays out. Yeah, great. Well, I want to wrap up here and like to end by just asking you both um, just kind of your final thoughts after this conversation. Start with Jacob. Well, final thoughts. I think um, there is tremendous opportunity. And for all the leaders out there, for all the individuals who are out there, whether you're leading teams or not, uh, you're still a leader if you're leading yourself, which is something that all of us have to do. Um, so there is opportunity, be optimistic, focus on the positive and use this time as an opportunity to learn and grow and, and develop with all these wonderful technologies and tools we have at our disposal. Don't use this as a time to you know, think about all the negative, use it as a time to build yourself up, learn new skills, learn new mindsets. Mm. Um, use it as a time to build, whereas others around you might be using it as a time to kind of hunker down. Uh, but at the end of the day, to use a cliche, is there is opportunity and I think there is a silver lining in all this. Mm. Right. And Matt? From my perspective, it's really all about choice. Uh, the situation is what it is, and we have to make choices about how to manage and adjust to it. And uh, taking time to reflect, taking time to listen, are essential first steps in making choices that are best for you and for the organizations you lead. But ultimately, by understanding what motivates you, what motivates the people you lead, and coming up with clear direction and being able to tell stories that motivate people, I think are the way to get through this and end up in a better position. Uh, than perhaps you started. So reflect on the situation you're in, think about the choices you have, commit to the choices, come up with ways for articulating that to motivate and excite people, and then go do it. Great, thanks Matt. And the most difficult question I like to ask people as a, an ending here is what is one word you would like to leave that really kind of embodies or captures this idea of what future intelligent leadership needs? And so, uh, Jacob, what's one word? Well, the cover of my new book is a lighthouse. So, uh, ah, nice. So I'm going to go with a lighthouse. That's great. And Matt? Yeah, my turn, huh? So the, <laughs> immediately the first, the, the first word that came to my mind, and I'm going to go with that, is inspiration, inspire. inspire. Uh, to me, inspiration is... Uh, both internal and external. It's about reflection, it's about communication, and it's about unity, bringing people together. And mm -hmm. to me, those are the things that 
the future needs, and those are the things that I believe future leaders should aspire to. That's great. I think I think there's a definitely a relationship between a lighthouse and inspiration. So thank you both, Jacob and Matt, for your time, for your wisdom, your insights today, and I uh, hope to have you on again in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tyler. Thank you for joining us today on the Flowcast. To get a summary of today's dialogue, find out more about today's guests, listen to previous episodes, or discover more about Haku Global's neuroscience-based Futures Intelligent Leadership programs or customized strategic foresight and innovation sprints, visit us at www.haku.global. At Haku Global, we believe it is time for more Futures Intelligent Leadership. The future is something we need to think more intelligently and feel more deeply about so we can collaborate to discover today's solutions for future problems. If you are in a leadership role and need support or training to scale futures intelligence across your organization, then contact us at Haku Global. This is your host, Tyler Mongan, and until next time, have a preferred and conscious future. Aloha.